Uh, hi, my name's Lizanne Falsetto, and I beat the often path by entering into the food world to disrupt and to bring portability of food that is better for your health and better for the planet. Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. On this show, we showcase unusual success stories and people who've had careers outside the box to remind us all that there is much more possible in this life than we've been led to believe. Well, boy, do we have a great episode for you today. Because joining me today is Lizanne Falsetto. And long before she became an entrepreneur, Lizanne had a career as a model. She developed a food for herself on the job and quickly discovered that her peers were interested in what she was making. She went on to create Think Thin, the gluten-free protein bars that you've seen on the shelves of pretty much every grocery store since the 90s. Now, she sold that company a few years ago, and now she's building Betterland Foods and Woo Bars, two game-changing products that are animal-free. She's basically transforming the dairy industry with her revolutionary new company. It acts like milk, it behaves like milk, it's achieved with fermentation, but it's not milk, and it's filling a gap that we didn't know that we had. It's super interesting for me personally. Today we're going to learn how her career took a series of unexpected twists and turns, and it's going to give us all inspiration on what's possible. Now, she's been decorated with an impressive array of awards and accolades. She's well known for her philanthropy, so I'm just deeply honored to hear the story of entrepreneurial pioneer Lizanne Falsetto. Well, I'm very excited to have you here, Lizanne. It's an absolute honor to have you joining the show today. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So when I look at your website, your personal one and your company website, first of all, I'm just blown away by the stuff that you have done because your personal website summarizes almost everything that I value. You show organic farming. You have a commitment to creating food and better food products in a better, more natural way. You also educate people and you have built a nice career for yourself along the lines that I deeply value. So I'm very, very excited to hear your story today. No, thanks, Ross. You know, it, it's funny because you never really know what your journey is, right, until you're in it. And uh, I think my journey started probably with a rooted Italian family that loved to cook, loved food, and loved family. And uh, I think that's why I'm in the food world today. Oh, interesting. What part of Italy is your family from? Uh, Campobasso. So my so family... And the boot, okay, my grandma was from a region called Ischia. I've never been there, but I also have an Italian grandma and great-grandma, so that tradition was passed on to me as well, and food is extremely important to me as well, maybe it because is. of that. It's, yeah, it's passion, it's fun, it's health, right? It's 80% of your whole health uh, regime, and um, I think breaking bread every Sunday as a child with... 20 Italians probably kept me in that mood, drinking wine that my grandfather made that tasted like vinegar at seven years old, going, yeah. ooh, this is not good. So, uh, yeah, I really I really love being in the food world. So you probably had a deep-seated memory and feeling of food being related to love and comfort and an expression of things that we value. I assume that maybe stuck with you. I think so. I think it's in the roots yeah. of who I am. Even uh, even 30 years plus, I still enjoy going to the grocery store and reading labels and understanding what the new technology is bringing to the forefront. I think what we have up against us now, though, is, of course, the environmental crisis and, uh, you know, awareness around, uh, you know, we, uh, we treat diabetes, but we have... Uh, you know, sugar in our products. And yeah. so it, it's kind of a, a a twist on what do you put first, right? And I think food needs to have a, a, a revamp in many, many ways to help people live a longer life. Absolutely. And one of the things that we talk about on the show is win-win-wins or killing multiple birds with one stone. And food is one of those areas where it can be not only better for you personally, but it can be better for the planet and it can help us solve some of these big things at the same time as helping ourselves and helping us feel better. So how did you settle on this is something that I want to do or build a company out of because this was not where you always were in your career? 
No, it's pretty funny, right? I mean, you know, I I didn't like school a lot. I didn't. I went to a great school, Catholic uh, school, private school, and uh, I love sport. But school to me was boring, and I think I was more of a visual type of of learner. And I had the opportunity out of high school to either go play basketball in college or travel and enter into the modeling world. And for me, I think, you know, you can be book smart and you can be travel smart, right? There's two different ways of kind of thinking about the way you learn. And and uh, I chose the fashion world and I learned a lot about cultures, food, uh, medicinal herbs, spent a lot of time in Japan and a lot of time in China and Hong Kong and and then I spent a lot of time in Europe. And so as I kind of weaved my way through that career for 15 years, I I think the source of my excitement was always about the culture and the food. How do people eat? What do they grow? Um, what do they do for homeopathic, functional, or white coat medicine, pharmaceutical? And um, I just always had my eye on you know, feeling good about what I ate and put in my body. And uh, when I came back to the States, I was 28, and uh, I thought I'd be a chef. And that's kind of how I started my first business, was in the kitchen. So did you want to be a chef at a restaurant first, or did you want to be more of a creator of foods at that point? You know, it's interesting because I didn't know. I mean, I... I, I uh, I didn't know. I just knew that I love to work with food. I love to entertain. I love to cook. I love planning meals. And my grandmother was an extraordinarily good cook. She didn't just bake well, she cooked well. And that's very rare because, you know, baking is very accurate and to the point. Uh, cooking is kind of a little this, a little that. And I was definitely more of a cook, but I love two things my grandmother made. She made a brownie that would you would die for. And mm. she had a chocolate chip cookie and a and she also had a peanut butter cookie, but the chocolate chip cookie and the brownie were the two products that I thought I was going to tear them apart in my kitchen and I was going to try to pull out the sugar and add protein to them. And so I started the process and it took about six months. And during that time, I was still modeling uh, to support myself. And I started making these bars that were on a slab sheet like cookies. And I would take them to the modeling gigs. And next thing I knew, everybody was asking every day, hey, Lizanne, do you have one of those? Do you have one of those? And I'm thinking, okay, wait, is this a business? Mm. And that's how I fell into nutrition bars. That was back when Power Bar Cliff Bar and Balance Bar were the only bars on the market. 1993, long time ago. Hard to believe how far we've come in such a relatively short time. Yeah, it's true. At that point, were you dairy-free in the products that you were making? Were you personally exploring a vegetarian or a vegan lifestyle, or had that not entered no. the conversation? No, no, I've never been vegan, never been dairy-free. I, You know... I listened to my body and I learned that in the fashion world because you would travel for a month somewhere and come back and you'd have jet lag and food was the equalizer. It was the one thing that kept me balanced. It kept me awake. It kept my skin looking good. And as a fashion model, you have to, you know, your personality and your mood has a lot to do with your physical because the combination of the two is, is what the work is that you're performing. And so I was always very aware that if I ate too much dairy or lactose, it upset me. Or if I ate gluten, gluten was the biggest thing for me. I never felt good on gluten. And, you know, gluten's glue, right? Uh, Think Thin was probably one of the first products that had gluten free on it when I launched it. But um, I eat everything and I am very careful about the types of food I combined. And and if I feel like eating it, I eat it. And if I don't, I don't. But I listen to my body. Mm. Very good. Yeah. 
that makes sense because obviously you've settled on a new product, which uh, one year in the making, Betterland Foods, which is a dairy alternative, which is super, super exciting to somebody like me who uh, my wife and I don't really drink milk or eat much dairy. Uh, but we have a daughter, we're raising a girl, and it's a bit different when you have a kid. You think, what kind of nutrition does she need? And I don't want to shortchange her by not giving her the nutrients she needs. So we struggle with the question of what kind of milk should you give while still being ethical in this world, while still having a set of values, such as wanting to be more plastic-free, wanting to avoid the dairy industry as it is. Uh, so how did you settle on this as a concept then? Well, I had I had 30 years with Think Then, and I built that business and sold it. And then I kept my eye on the protein world. I really love the commodity world and watching what's happening with the environment. We know that the farmlands are getting, you know, polluted because they have to produce more because we have more mouths to feed, but then we're hurting the environment. And so the weather causes issues on the food. Uh, the protein market is dwindling down to the point where there will not be enough whey protein for people to consume. And protein is the number one ingredient that for me, I love to eat a hundred grams or more a day. And through COVID, I started doing some research about different types of proteins. And, you know, it's very interesting when you think about companies in the tech world that are able to clone an actual protein and produce it without the animal. And, you know, I do eat meat and I do like milk without lactose. I like the flavor of it. I like cooking with it. And uh, I started checking out Perfect Day and Perfect Day is a alternative whey protein that is made through a fermentation process and they're able to create a whey protein that tastes even better than whey from an animal, from a cow. And uh, I reached out and started playing a bit with their protein in the, in the kitchen, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how, how delicious it was, how it frothed, how you could bake with it. And then I started playing a little bit with it in my blender because I like smoothies. And that's when it kind of hit me that this could be something that could go into the dairy world, that this could replace milk. And as you know, we have almond, we have oat, we have all these options, but nothing tastes and acts and performs like milk. That's true. Milk is delicious. And, you know, most people have many different milks. I bet your refrigerator has an almond and an oat and, you know, maybe it for does. your daughter, you have milk. That's correct. Yeah, all of yeah. the above. Well, so so the great thing about Betterland milk is we are better milk, better for you and better for the planet. And, you know, it has the eight grams of protein. It has zero cholesterol. It has half the sugar and 50% less carbs, but it tastes and performs like milk. So I think that the alternative space today of almond, oat, gosh, now there's cauliflower, potato, hemp, soy, all of those products are the bridge to where we're going with our product in the food tech world of protein. Yeah, I think that that's, tr that's true. And in certain circumstances, you notice it more. For example, in coffee, the way oat milk or almond milk, the way that they don't really interact with coffee the same way that milk right. does. Right, it goes flat. Right? Yeah, and you it make a cappuccino, flat. but it's not the same. And you can no. do that. So generally, I find that I prefer black coffee to those types of things, even though I love oat milk and mm -hmm. almond milk and other things, like protein uh, smoothies and that kind of thing. I enjoy it. But specifically in certain contexts, or like you said, with baking, it does tend to fall short. It doesn't do what you need it to do. And that's a big part of being able to replace it. I and totally agree. Also, yep. when you're staring down the barrel of the prospect of what do I feed my kid whose brain is growing? And that's something that my wife and I wrestled with a lot because we were completely hardcore vegan for a couple years and then we dialed it back. 
we were struggling a bit to get what we needed just on that diet. So we started doing a vegetarian. Now we still don't eat meat of any kind, no cow or, or beef or any of that. But we do sometimes eat cheese on pizza. We do sometimes eat dairy. Sometimes we eat eggs. Sometimes we eat fish. I'll just be very honest about all of that. But when you're thinking about what do I give my kid, it's a very different discussion because in theory, you'd say, I'd love to raise her without ever eating an animal product. But there are certain realities you think, I really don't want her to grow up to be somehow mentally deficient or physically deficient or miss certain key things. So we wrestle with this a lot. And in the end, we kind of landed on a hybrid uh, solution where we give her regular milk, but we don't give her meat or other animal products, and she seems to be doing fine. But it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a big deal. Um, and so your product, especially for me and for us personally, is very interesting. When I came across it for the first time, I thought, wow, this is really something that has the potential to be a game changer for a lot of people like me. Yeah, you know, I think it's the impossible burger of dairy. Yeah. Um, if you look at what, you know, impossible burger did with meat, um, there are, the population is growing and we don't have enough food. You have to build, you know, space for people to live. So the farmlands gets broken down. You've got issues with agriculture and you know, weather and every day you turn on the news and there's something there that's causing a disruption in in the soil. And so where are you going to get your food source? And also, I don't think that we treat our animals well because of the stress that we put them under to be able to produce. You know, there's there's just so many reasons why we need to step outside our box and start to think about the future of the planet and our food source. And that's what we're doing at Better Land Foods. We're really trying to understand how to deliver the best tasting, the best performing product that's great for your health, it's, it's enjoyable to consume, and we're thinking about the planet in relationship to uh, you know, what's happening in the world today. I, th I think it's a fabulous initiative. And I also think it's fascinating that you've chosen this without necessarily being a hardcore a vegan or something like that yourself, that you recognize that there was a need for this outside of, I don't want to say outside of your own beliefs, but that you saw something that was worth pursuing in spite of that. I think that's really great and really noble. And I wish that there were more people who on both sides, let's say, reached across the aisle to each other and to help bridge the gap that we have. Because so much of modern media shows that, like take Blade Runner 2049, these futuristic dystopian movies, they always show that, oh, the worst part about a dystopian future aside from cities crumbling and there being eternal winter and everything is gray, but there's also no more meat, there's also no more animal products, and it's presented as this horrific nightmarish scenario. But I've never felt that that had to be the case. It can be really positive. If, if something is good and you enjoy it and it gives your body what it needs and it tastes great and does what you expect it to do, then it's not a lack. It's not, I'm missing this other thing or life would be so much better if I had this other thing. It's just a better version of something that you like. So I'm very personally passionate about anything like that that gives us what we need, but that pays more attention to the environment and the context in which the product exists. I think yeah. it's great. Yeah, it's, it's you know, if you, if, if you think about, especially for you raising a daughter and knowing that, you know, you're creating a human being that you want to have the best and you want to make sure she's got the proteins in her system, you want to make sure the ingredients are as clean as possible. Our our products are all plant based, um, and you don't compromise the taste. So they're not being raised on something that doesn't taste good, right? Because food is enjoyable, food is fun, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be um, enjoyed all the way through. So um, I totally agree with you. I think that there's a food revolution happening. And Betterland Foods really wants to take that on. We've got two products. We've got the Betterland Milk, which will be launching in October. And um, we also have a, a candy product called wooBar.com, 
which is uh, we're going after the old Snickers, Milky Way, Reese's, and we're using all plant-based proteins. And if you think about what Think Thin was in the protein world, um, this is the candy protein world of what we're doing with Wu. Which also ready for disruption, if you ask me. A hundred percent. They haven't changed their profile for over 65 years. The candy that you're eating is poison. Yeah. That's why it tastes so good, right? That's why you gain weight. That's why there's diabetes and obesity and, um, and you know, shame on them, right? You look at Mars and General Mills and uh, Nestle and Hershey's, and they have the opportunity to be able to create food that's better for you, but they haven't done it in over 65 years. And so I think you have to have entrepreneurs that want to disrupt the world like we do at Betterland Foods, and, and that's what we do. And the other really intriguing thing about how you have chosen to solve this problem or perfect day is that fermentation plays a key role in it. I find that to be fascinating. We seem to be learning a lot more about fermentation in general and its health benefits. And I don't know yeah, if you're familiar. Kombucha. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Michael Pollan. Do you know who he is? Yes, he has a of documentary. Course. I, yeah. Um, and he has a book slash documentary called Cooked, which came out a little while ago, his previous round. And he talks a bit about how fermentation in bread, how we've shortcutted this, and therefore that might be the reason for a lot of people, and perhaps even your gluten intolerance, is that it's actually perhaps not the gluten itself, but the way in which the gluten is made. And he talks about the difference between bread coming from three ingredients, water and flour, and salt versus coming from anything that has yeast added to it, which basically bypasses the natural fermentation process of the bread. And obviously I have no studies to confirm that, but it's something that really stuck with me as perhaps it's the way in which we achieve these things that matters. And it's easy to, I think, make a product that texturally feels like something that feels like milk or or meat, but it's harder to make that feel like something that you, that you're replacing, but also have it still be actually good for you and not just worse, right? <laughs> because I'm sure right. there's a way to make the texture of milk that would be very bad for you. But how did you discover this fermentation process in relationship to this other style of milk? Well, so, you know, the protein is made through the fermentation process. So, you know, cheese comes from fermentation. I mean, this is nothing new. This is thousands and thousands of years old, this technique. And, you know, people say, oh, well, you're 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 making it in a lab or it's coming. It it's it's ridiculous because fermentation has been around for thousands of years. It's it's again in your cheese, it's kombucha, it's beer. The beer you drink is made through fermentation. And What Perfect Day did is they figured out how to take that process and how to clone a whey protein and make a identical fermentation from it. And that's why it's called precision fermentation is because it's precise to the exact uh, activity that that actual protein can do. And it is as good as protein for your body it tastes better than a whey protein. It just is lighter and fluffier. And, and so when you when you look at a perfect day protein and then you look at, say, protein powder and you look at a whey protein powder from a cow, you can tell the difference by the light, um, frothy feel to the protein itself. And um, the flavor is just delicious. And so you know, with the ingredients that we added to our milk, including the protein, we added coconut water, we added other ingredients that sunflower um, oil, we were able to clone milk to the point where you don't have to go to almond or oat because they don't perform as well. And um, you get the vitamins, you get the taste, you get the absorption, and you don't have to sacrifice. It's just a win-win for everybody. Sounds remarkable. 
and obviously this is a relatively new endeavor. So this is, I saw 2021, you began this. Now we've talked a little bit about Think. So let's go back to those early days when you were doing modeling and you were bringing this product with you and you said, hey, maybe there's a business here. And how did you begin that first journey into business at that time? What were the steps that you took to bring that new product to market, the Think Thin Bar or whatever you did first? Well, I um I I gave it to many people in the fashion industry and realized that I was doing my own test study which I didn't even know what that was, right? Coming out of modeling, I never had to pay to do some sort of quantified test study, but um I utilized the fashion industry who are conscious of what they put in their body because they have to look good they have to be a certain weight they want to have energy they don't want jet lag and i realized after they started asking for more and more and more and i'd come home and bake until two in the morning that this was a this was something that was real and you know what I find really interesting about entrepreneurship is I, I think I was born an entrepreneur. Um, and I know people use that title kind of, you know, as a hey, I'm on a, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm gonna build a business and sell it in three years. Well, that's that's not what an entrepreneur does. What an entrepreneur does is they focus on something that they're passionate about and they drive it all the way. You know, you don't do it for the money. You do it because you love to wake up and and to build something that can make a difference in the world. And when I decided that I was going to try to get into this, not knowing anything, right? I, I had never sold, you know, anything in the food world. And the food world is like dealing with the mafia. It's not easy. <laughs> it's uh, it's that is a, the stereotype. It's a tough, it's, it's a retail, you know, monopoly. That's for sure. And um, what what i enjoyed is that through the journey of going to market i went from my small kitchen to a middle sized baking kitchen that was the first step then from there i went from the baking kitchen to large vat manufacturing and that took a while that took a good year to figure out how to find the ingredients that i wanted make sure that the product had 20 grams of protein my first product was 20 grams of protein zero grams of sugar and gluten-free and that was in 1993 and if you look at where we're at today gluten is 27 percent of category growth and i attribute that to think then uh it was the first product that had gluten-free on it and um, sugar i always save my sugar for my drinks if i'm gonna have a glass of wine and i know that i hold all the sugar out of my body i'm gonna have that glass of wine with dinner i enjoy it i was raised on wine mm -hmm. not the stuff my grandpa makes but <laughs> the good stuff <laughs> and um and i also you know wanted my protein protein satiated me it gave me energy it built muscle i felt better i you know i had energy and so i went to market and it was it was a long haul I, it took me 20 years when I first Whoa. launched, people didn't even know what protein was. They, they'd they say, well, how much protein do I need? One gram, two gram? People didn't even know that protein was a necessity. And this is in the early 1990s. I do believe that, yeah. Yeah, so it took a lot of education. And through that process, I think I, I, I learned as I made mistakes, which we do as entrepreneurs, and I surrounded myself with very smart people. And if I didn't know how to do something, I'd bring it, bring in a consultant, like a logistics, for example. Like I didn't understand trucking and logistics in the food world. You know, do you have to have a reefer truck, cold truck, not, you know, you're going through Nevada where it's 110, will the bars melt? I didn't know how to manage that. And so I brought in somebody for a week and I learned it. I went to Harvard. So you know, did I go to college? I probably went to college at, every year for at least a month because I put myself in a situation where I learned to help build my business on the right path. Well, you mentioned that it's more important to be committed to something and to see it all the way through versus just going for that big payday. So you obviously stuck with Think for a very long time, for decades. And then relatively recently, you did end up selling it. So what was the motivation 
for making the switch? Were you ready for a new challenge at that point? Did you just feel that you had more innovations to make in other categories? Yeah, it's a good question. It just was time. You know, I I I I realized that people started to, you know, Cheerios had protein in it, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, you 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 start to see people catching on and consumers understanding that they have to have protein. And by the way, anybody, your daughter, right, at her age, young, anybody from one to a hundred should be eating protein. So it's a it's a really incredible category. And that's why I started this other business because of that, because now we're bringing forth a new and improved protein that can feed the hungry mouths around the world and the growing population, save the animals so that they don't have to be under such stressed conditions and help the planet. Less water, you know? So, you know, I think I think as an entrepreneur, you you know when you're two feet in and you know when it's time to be two feet out. And for me, I knew that I wanted to build the business. I didn't know I was building a business, by the way. But as I went through it, I loved it. It was stressful. It was hard. You know, I I really am a workaholic to a certain point. I'm trying to balance that now. But to work and to know that you love what you do and you're bringing forth something that can change the way people think about food it just drives you. You know, you wake up in the morning and you can't wait to get back to the next conversation or the next push. So I sold Think Thin because it was the right time. People understood that food um, that food was an absolute uh, necessary part of, of their food with protein, of their daily diet. And that's when I knew it was time to sell the brand. Mm. Makes perfect sense. What would you say are some of the lessons that you carried with you from the first massive business to the new endeavor? Anything that you did differently or that you had maybe more nuance around the thought process? Well, you know, my first business with Think Thin was a business that I built without knowing I was building it. I didn't know. I was doing it just because I was doing it. This business is a purposed chosen decision and i came out of retirement and you know i'm thinking do i really want to do this again it's not easy and you know okay so you might have a little bit of money and you might have but it's it's you you got to roll your sleeves up and you've got to get in there and you work it doesn't it doesn't matter um you know what you have or how many people you know it it's strategic and um I thought that Think Thin was going to be my legacy, but I do believe that if I could bring something forth on the planet that could be just like what Impossible Burger did, but for dairy, um, you know, I I went out and I and I brought in people, Bill Picard, who's was my VP of Operations and Innovation R and D at Think Thin, and. He's my president here and he's brilliant and smart and he's incredible when it comes to innovation. And, you know, you bring in people now that you enjoy to work with. You know, I have a no asshole rule. Uh, I don't want to work with people that <laughs> don't want to work, right? I want people that are solid and and believe in the same legacy. And so we've built an incredible team and and, um, you know, the landscape of retail has changed. COVID has changed. Amazon came in and bought all the direct-to-consumer eyeballs. And and now we've got to turn around with a recession around the corner that's, you know, the economy's not good and you can't print money for two years through COVID and think that you're not going to hit the wall. So the, the, the journey is going to be harder. That's for sure. But... Um, we're up for the challenge and we believe that if we can bring a product with better than milk to the table that tastes as good as milk or better will win the 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 war on dairy and so that's our goal well that's a fabulous mission fabulous goal 
I think you're poised to do it. You're clearly the person to do it. Wow, I, I appreciate that. Wish you boatloads of success. I'm very excited to try these products. I haven't yet, but I want to bring them in and try them and we'll definitely post a review as we do. Um, but it's it's very exciting for me and I love staying abreast of these new developments. It's kind of what I live for. I live for unearthing the people out there who are committed to solving the problems that are facing us all. And I think there's nothing more noble that somebody can do in general than to put it upon themselves to solve some of the problems that face us all, even if not all of us know that these problems are facing us, even if many of us are blissfully ignorant about the true state of affairs of the world and what's to come in the next 10, 20, 30 years. It's comforting to me to know that smart people like you are out there working on this and thinking about this so that it's not just one giant blind side 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 75 years from now, whenever a lot of these other structures stop working. So, oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And you keep up the good work with your podcast. It always helps to get the voice out there. I'd be happy to do that. And I want to uh, give you the closing remark here. So now that we're at the end of our discussion, if there's anything that you want to promote or direct people to, I would love it if you could uh, share whatever you like to wrap this episode up. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, all I can say is um, do some research. Go to betterlandfoods.com. We have uh, woobars.com and betterlandmilk.com. And educate yourself on on the opportunity to look at something that you can bring into your kitchen and really enjoy. And I would say that, you know, there is a food revolution going on. And one of the things I always say is, you know, you can you can eat something and wonder why your tummy's upset, or you can eat something and wonder why you have the hiccups, or, you know, you just don't feel good. You have a headache. Sugar is not good for you. Gluten is glue. And protein is key to long life, keeping your muscles sturdy and strong. So, um, you know, you can always uh, look at my Instagram at Lizanne Falsetto. And um, I really appreciate the time that you gave me, Ross. Thank you. I really appreciate the time that you gave me. Thank you for your sharing your story. Deeply honored and humbled to have you here. And so that's it, folks. That's the end of this podcast. It's officially over. Oh, yeah.